This channel is part of the History Hit Network. This is Canada's national monument to the Great War on Vimy Ridge. It commemorates the great victories of the Canadian Corps and their 60,000 fallen. The story of the Canadian Corps is one that starts in 1914 as amateur soldiers and takes the Canadians into being the greatest fighting force in the Western Front. Two of the least known battles and two of the major turning points in the development of the Canadian Corps were the battles of Montsorel and Hill 70. 5,000 Canadians died on those lost battlefields. In 1914, Canada was a prosperous country of seven and a half million souls, a distant, peaceful outpost of the British Empire, an empire that is at war and fighting for its survival. But to many Canadians, like a young farmer called Harry Laird, that war seems very far away. In those days, my quiet little hometown of Blenheim, Ontario was a happy place sheltered by the great mother country, England. The rumor of war in Europe served only to increase our feelings of security. Even England's declaration of war did not seem such a mighty thing at first. And then came the call for volunteers. We were surprised. We could not believe that England would need us, but we all agreed it was our chance, and so the enlisting began. Like tens of thousands of Canadians, Harry Laird signs up as soon as he can. Canada, when the Great War begins, has hardly any professional army at all, only 3,000 men. But in a few short months, tens of thousands of volunteers form the beginning of what will become the Canadian Corps. When the first Canadian contingent sailed away, 35,000 strong, our enthusiasm and pride were boundless. The warm June sun, the quiet water, the far blue sky so filled the heart with the eternal charm of peace that the mind forgot the object of our mission, the very presence in the world of evil things. Around the bastion of the Vimy Memorial are engraved the names of 11,000 Canadian soldiers that were killed in France during the Great War and have no known grave. These are the fallen comrades of the Canadian Corps. The Canadian Corps throughout the war was primarily volunteers. They were clerks and they were farmers and they were salesmen and teachers. Most of these men for sure came over here to get into the big adventure. So they had uh, illusions of what war was like. Sadly, for most of them, their first taste of battle was their last. For these inexperienced young Canadians, the gateway to the battlefield is the once beautiful Belgian city of Ypres. By 1916, the fighting near Ypres has been going on for almost two years. Ever since, in August 1914, the German army invaded Belgium and France, but was held along a 700-kilometer line known as the Western Front. Protecting Ypres is a bulge in the Allied line, a bulge known as the Ypres salient. The Germans throw everything they have against this last piece of Belgium in Allied hands. But when, in the summer of 1916, the bulk of the British Army is preparing to launch a huge offensive in France, Ypres has become a secondary front. And it is here that the 60,000 men of the Canadian Corps are assigned. 
Even in quiet times, Ypres is a deadly place, as a tough young Scot from Calgary, Private Donald Fraser, soon discovers. Ypres, strangely silent, with its gaunt skeleton buildings frowning down upon you, is a dead city, and a city of the dead. Beneath its crumbling walls and accumulated debris, many bodies of soldiers and civilians lie entombed. The nauseous and peculiar odors emanating from the buried cellars arise from the dead. Bosch gave vent to his spleen by pouring thousands of shells on this helpless city. Never an hour passed without a new strafe. At every period of the day, the explosion of shells reverberated through the silent streets. If you love history, then you will love History Hit. Our extensive library of documentary features everything from the ancient origins of our earliest ancestors to the daring mission to sink the Bismarck. History Hit has hundreds of exclusive documentaries with unrivaled access to the world's best historians. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial and Timeline fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code TIMELINE at checkout. We're in the fields just east of Ypres in Belgium, not far from a place known as Shrapnel Corner. And during the First World War, this was one of the deadliest places on earth. Even today, walking through these fields, just in a few minutes, you pick up all sorts of artifacts from the Great War. For example, here is some shrapnel. It looks like it's British. Here's a 303 cartridge, another one, and even a British button. You can speculate that a crossroad such as this must have received about a million hits during the Great War. Of course, all the activity would be at nighttime, and so the Germans, of course, who control all these heights, which is why the salient was so important, would just literally pepper in the shells. And of course, they'd always target crossroads. All the transport, all the men would only be moving at night, so a lot of people would be killed right at this corner. Nearing Shrapnel Corner, we heard shrapnel whistling through the air, bursting over the road. We were going to run the gauntlet. We had to keep our wits about us, and once or twice had to take shelter avoiding shells bursting ahead of us in our path. On the other side of Shrapnel Corner, a horse, recently killed, blocked part of the road. Making another dash, we came across a couple of artillery officers, and beside them was a notice stating that there was no foot or wagon passage this way during the day. Pointing to the notice, I asked if it was obsolete. The reply came back, nothing is supposed to be alive in this area. In the spring of 1916, the Canadian Corps was ordered north. The Canadians coming into these fields, though, were very inexperienced troops. They only had one group of men that were at all experienced, which is the 1st Division, and the 3rd Division was brand new, and it included a, a bunch of farmers from Ontario or clerks from Toronto, and one of those men was Harry Laird. We reached the frontline trench soon. There was a good deal of firing going on, and at one place we had to crowd up against the wall and make room for two stretcher bearers going out with a dead soldier. The man had been struck in the head, and there was little human semblance left. The machine gun bullets were ripping the bags along the parapet. I must have had an anxious look on my face, for one of the old heads came close to me, and looking at me squarely in the face said, Don't worry, son. If you're going to get it, you'll get it. Harry Laird is one of the thousands of rookie troops of the Canadian 3rd Division, settling in along the front line. Defending the last ridge of high land that protects Ypres, the Canadian line stretches from the village of Hooge through Sanctuary Wood to Mount Sorel. The Germans decide in May of 1916 to seize this last bit of high ground protecting Ypres and to destroy the Canadians. The Germans bring thousands of specially trained assault troops up to the front line. They haul up heavy artillery and mortars. 
Using aerial reconnaissance, they piece together a picture of Canadian defenses. German troops probe the Canadian front line. Observing the German activity from Sanctuary Wood is a major with the Princess Pats, Agar Adamson. Agar is 50 years old, blind in one eye, and had served in the Boer War. Eager not to miss out on the big adventure, Agar signed up for the new war. Almost every day, he writes to his wife, Mabel. Dear Mabel, we have had two very exciting days. The Germans sent forward an attacking party. Our rifle and machine gun fire prevented many of them from entering any part of the trench. All the Germans were killed. The dead Germans in our lines are a fine looking lot and are in quite new uniforms. Never thine, Agar. We're on what were the Canadian front lines in the spring of 1916. The Canadian positions were, went from over here, which was Montsorel, this little knoll of trees over here, across to Hill 62 or Tortop, about two kilometers away. These positions were the only heights that controlled Yeep, and the Germans wanted them. And you can see from here why they wanted those positions. Yeep is only three kilometers away. The German plan for taking the heights was a simple one. They were going to concentrate all their artillery of all calibers, including trench mortars, howitzers, and they were going to blast the Canadians from the ridge. They were going to blow the positions from Sanctuary Wood down to Montsorel. To do this, though, they had to prepare the ground. They had to dig the gun pits, bring up the munitions, dig new trenches. And of course, the Canadians in the front lines right here could see this. And they were obviously very nervous by what they were seeing. But to make matters worse, they could actually hear the German miners tunneling underneath. During the first night, we heard a peculiar sound like the tap of a hammer on metal a long way off. This remained a mystery to us until the next day when we were told that the Germans had been tunneling under our trench for a long time and that the sound we had heard was the sound of their picks and excavating tools in the ground under our feet. With their minds in place, the Germans are now ready. The Canadians have no idea that such a massive and deadly attack is coming. Dear Mabel, we had a battalion concert last night. Buller sang Yip Hai Adi Hayaha. It is very warm, and the shorts I am wearing, though not quite loose enough, are a comfort. General Mercer, who received us, said my knees would do many a woman proud. What do you think he meant? Fifty-seven-year-old General Malcolm S. Mercer, commander of the 3rd Division, has been in the fighting from the beginning. Alarmed by reports from the front line about the increased German activity, Mercer travels to the Canadian Corps headquarters, 20 kilometers behind the front line at Chateau Abiel. We're in the village of Abiel on the French-Belgian border, and it was here that the Canadian Corps had its headquarters in the spring of 1916. This modest building, known as Chateau Abiel, was the home to the Canadian generals who ran the Corps, and at the end of May 1916, a new commander arrived by the name of Julian Bing. A British aristocrat and a long-time professional soldier, Julian Bing will prove to be a charismatic and imaginative leader. Sent to lead the Canadians, he protests that he knows nothing at all about Canadians. Only days after taking command, Bing learns of the increased German activity and asks Mercer to investigate. Just before dawn, on June the 2nd, 1916, Malcolm Mercer leaves for the Canadian front lines. He does not realize he is heading into a deadly trap. Dawn, 
June the 2nd, 1916. A calm, beautiful, strangely quiet morning. All along the Canadian front line, thousands of troops are busy with the morning's routines. One of them is Harry Laird, with a 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles near Sanctuary Wood. June 2nd welcomed us with a perfect dawn. The sun rising from behind the heights occupied by the Germans cast long, broken streams through the trees of Sanctuary Wood. The cuckoos were calling to one another in the wood behind us in an excited manner. They never failed to make a lot of noise just before a heavy artillery attack. We're in the refurbished trenches of the Sanctuary Wood Trench Museum. On June the 1st, the commander of the 3rd Division, General Mercer, received his orders from General Bing to go and check out what was happening on the Montserrat front to see what the Germans were up to. So like any good general, uh, the next day, around 8.30 in the morning, he gets his entourage of staff officers and aide-de-camps, and he decides to go and check out Montserrat. But of course, Mercer's timing couldn't have been worse. Some of our fellows glanced behind them and muttered imprecations at the cuckoos. And then it came. With the suddenness and fury past all understanding, the monster artillery action burst upon us. Out of that rare and peaceful sunrise came the havoc of death, blighting in an instant the charm and quiet of those early hours. Shells and projectiles burst everywhere about us with a force that lifted us off our feet. Bits of shrapnel and pieces of bursting shells deluged the ground, killing and maiming the men. Hundreds of German howitzers, mortars and field guns never let up, concentrating on the front line of the 3rd Division. General Mercer tries to telephone back for artillery support, but all the lines are cut. He basically arrives at the front just in time for the huge German bombardment. And of course, this is like a curtain of fire, so these guys can't get back. Now they're trapped in the front. And like so many men of the 4th Mounted Rifles, they go into tunnels such as this, which are being used by miners, and it's inside they try to stay safe from the shelling. But of course, this is a problem because once the shelling stops, the German infantry only have 100 yards or so to go, and they've captured them all. To Mercer's credit, he tries to make it out, and he gets hit by a piece of shell and later dies of his wounds. And of course, the other ones are all taken prisoners, but they're in tunnels just like this. As German shells continue to rain down, a few hundred meters north of Harry Laird, infantryman Frank McDonald scrambles for cover. We dropped pronto in the bottom of the trench. A shell hit the corrugated iron roof of a dugout, and a jagged piece of iron hurtling through the air struck Sergeant Sharp, cutting him almost in two. The mangled bodies of men were tossed and jumbled in the air to fall again on the men beneath. I crawled down the trench without seeing a single man who hadn't been wounded. The odor of blood and flesh was sickening and horrible. A shell burst with a blinding flash right in our faces. I felt something sharp and thin, like the blade of a knife, sticking out between my eyes. It was a piece of shrapnel, which had lodged in the lower part of my skull. One fellow, who had been mumbling and cursing, suddenly seemed to go out of his head, for he climbed out of the trench in the middle of all that fire and walked slowly back toward our support lines, refusing to answer when we shouted to him to come back. He'd only gone a few yards when a machine gun rattled, and he went down in a heap. At one o'clock, the German guns fall silent. Further down the line, Lieutenant J. Harvey Douglas of the 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles, with his arm and leg shattered, tries to crawl to safety. Suddenly, the bombardment ceased. It was as still as the tomb of death. I actually did believe for a moment I had gone to heaven, and that was the reason there was no noise. My conjectures were rudely dispelled by the most peculiar sensation I had ever experienced. The ground started to sway from side to side like a ship on a rough sea. The ground we were lying on rose what seemed to me about 
10 or 15 feet. I looked around and exclaimed, My God, there goes a mine. We could clearly see the stumps of tree, bits of trench, and parts of what had once been soldiers soaring upwards to a tremendous height. The air was filled with such a mass of earth that for a few moments, it was almost as dark as night. So everybody's going into the dugouts and they're just hanging on for a dear life. They're hitting the trenches and whole sections of trenches are being just blasted to smithereens and the men are being killed. The casualty rate is very high and of course, unfortunately for them, it got real quiet. They thought they were okay. Then all of a sudden, the mines go up and they can actually see their front line is just being totally obliterated. And of course, then the Germans are coming. We noticed jets of black smoke rising here and there, peering over the top of the ragged remains of the trench to find out what was happening. We saw the German mopping up party, making their way slowly along the line, and to our horror saw that they were pumping liquid fire, the cause of the smoke jets, on the wounded men in the shell holes, burning them up. In June 1916, the Canadians, for the first time, had to come up against the flamethrowers. And of course, these Canadians here, the first mounted rifles, are in a totally vulnerable position. They don't have a chance. And the German infantry are coming over the rise, rifles going, and of course, the flamethrowers. Now, later on, as people got more used to it, of course, they could shoot the tank on the guy's back. And of course, he would explode. But at this point, they would literally blow them in right out of a dugout. So all these small groups of mounted rifles caught in little trench alcoves or little dugouts were being trapped by the Germans, taken prisoner, or killed. In a few hours, 2,000 men of the 1st and 4th Canadian Rifles are killed, wounded, or missing. A few, like Laird, McDonald, and Douglas, survive to spend years in a German prison camp. As the Germans flood over the broken line, they capture Mount Sorel and a strategic spur of high ground known as Observatory Ridge. The deadly struggle now shifts to the Canadians holding Maple Copse. This is Maple Copse Cemetery. From Maple Copse, you can actually see the Canadian front lines of June 2nd, 1916. Right up there is Hill 62. And in the woods there is the Sanctuary Wood Trench Museum, which was the Canadian support lines. The men holding Maple Copse were the 5th Canadian Mounted Rifles from the Eastern Townships. And of course, they could watch the whole battle unfold. They could actually see the high explosive shells going off, the mines going off, and the heavy artillery, and the Germans advancing. They were very well dug in here, and they managed to shoot down the German infantry across these fields. The Germans then themselves started to dig in and called in their heavy artillery. And throughout the 2nd and 3rd of June, the 5th CMR hung tight here and held back the German advance. While the 5th Canadian Rifles hold on in Maple Cops, to the north, the Princess Pats and German infantry are locked in a life and death struggle in Sanctuary Wood. This beautiful forest was once the infamous Sanctuary Wood, and it was here that the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry made their stand on June 2nd, 1916. The Pats held the left of the Canadian line, and in a warren of trenches that cut all through this wood, they held against the Germans. In fact, it's in this action that their commander, Colonel Buller, gets up to direct the attack as it's going from trench to trench, and he's trying to point out to his men where the Germans are. There's a very famous painting that was passed around at the time by the Imperial Order of Daughters of the Empire to all the schools, and it was Buller standing on the parapet with his cane in hand, leading the machine gun fire, which was how he was killed, of course, because once he went above the parapet, no one was going to survive. Time has obscured much of the battlefield of 1916, but in fact here you can see 
part of an old trench or really an inundation, but you can actually see the traverse as the trench goes back across and around the other end. This is how they were always designed. And this would have been one of the trenches that the Pats were defending on June 2nd. And it was in trenches such as these that 600 Pats made their famous defense of sanctuary wood. One of the 600 was my great uncle John, who was in his first battle. And fortunately, he wasn't one of the 300 killed or wounded. He actually made it through unscathed. Returning from leave in England, Agar Adamson finds his beloved regiment shattered and most of his friends dead. My dear Mabel, the Princess Pats made a very gallant resistance, but had to retire. Our commander, Colonel Buller, was killed, and Galt, founder of the regiment, badly shot in the leg and back. Molson shot through the jaw. Cornish shot through both legs and arms, and his nose blown off. Glasgow shot dangerously. Niven shot through the body. We have lost about 480 men. In a few hours on June the 2nd, the Germans have torn a huge gap in the Canadian line, and the Canadian Corps has suffered a terrible loss. After the fighting on June the 2nd, about 2,000 Canadian soldiers were listed as missing. And of course, the most important man missing was General Mercer, the commander of the 3rd Canadian Division. He had literally disappeared in a puff of smoke on June the 2nd. And it wasn't really until later in the week that they found out what had happened to him, that he'd been killed by shrapnel in Sanctuary Wood. In fact, his body wasn't found until June 23rd, 1916, when he was reburied in this cemetery here. And this is his grave. Major General M.S. Mercer, C.B., commanding 3rd Canadian Division, 3rd of June, 1916. He was the highest ranking Canadian killed in the First World War. In the fighting on June 2nd, in its first battle, the Canadian 3rd Division has lost the last vital high ground protecting Ypres. Just days after taking command, Sir Julian Bing must retrieve the honor of the Canadian Corps. These quiet fields on the heights overlooking Ypres have seen many bloody battles. In two years fighting, the British Army has made it a point of honor to hold these lines. Now in one day, the Canadians have lost them. In the ferocious attack of June 2nd, 1916, the Germans had torn an enormous gap in the Canadian line, seizing the last heights protecting Ypres. That same night, the commander of the Canadian Corps, Sir Julian Bing, orders an immediate counterattack. But the attack is delayed and only begins the next morning. The commander of Bing's 1st Canadian Division, General Arthur Curry, a former real estate agent who's proved to be a superb soldier, is skeptical about the counterattack. There was a great deal of shelling, and although the units moved rapidly, they could not get to the appointed position in time. There was no certainty where the enemies were. The troops went forward most gallantly, but they hadn't sufficient artillery support, and the plan had been hastily prepared. I had no hopes whatever of the counterattack regaining the position. Julian Bing's counterattack fails to drive the Germans from the heights, but the Canadians do manage to advance along Observatory Ridge and build a new defensive line. The ruins of Hooge at the northern end of the Canadian line block the main highway towards Ypres. And it is here that the Germans, after a few days of quiet, once again suddenly attack the Canadians. We're on the grounds of Hooge Chateau, and Hooge was the left flank of the Canadian operations during the Battle of Montsorel. It had seen no action during the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, and 5th of June. But on the 6th of June, the Germans blew four huge mines under the Canadian positions here. 
These ponds you see, in fact, are not ponds. These are the mine craters that were created by those massive explosions and are really the grave of more than 100 Canadian men. Falling back through the ruins of Hooge, in a few hours, the Canadians lose more than 300 men. We're in the southwest corner of Railway Dugout's burial ground. And of course, it's got its name from being adjacent to the Railway Dugouts, which were all along this railway embankment here. Of course, you can't see them today. But during the First World War, in particular 1916, this whole area was inundated with dugouts for uh, advanced dressing stations, uh, munitions, battalion headquarters, and of course they even had a place where they would keep the dead bodies that were brought back from the front line and then be reburied over here in the cemetery. During uh, the Battle of Montsorel, Cannon Scott came through this position, as did almost every Canadian troop going to the front. From the beginning of the fighting, 57-year-old Canon Frederick Scott, a padre in the 1st Division, has always been close to the action. At the front, in a railway embankment, a series of dugouts furnished the brigade that was in the line with comfortable billets. The brigadier's abode had a fireplace in it. One of the dugouts was used as a morgue in which bodies were kept until they could be buried. A man told me that one night when he'd come down from the front very late, he found a dugout full of men wrapped in their blankets, everyone asleep. Without more ado, he crawled in among them and slept soundly till morning. When he awoke, he found to his horror that he had slept all night among the dead men in the morgue. This whole section is basically Montserrat casualties. This is a very poignant one. You can see that it's Private J. McKenzie, 7th Battalion Canadian Infantry, which is from British Columbia, 13th of June, 1916. And he was only 17 years old. And it says here, Dear Jim, someday, sometime, we'll understand. Loving sisters and brothers. He would have been killed at the attack on, on Montserrat itself uh, about midnight when they went over the top. Mount Sorel and Observatory Ridge will be the objectives of General Bing's major counterattack. After the failure of his first desperate assault, now Julian Bing takes his time. He will use the most experienced Canadian troops, those of the 1st Canadian Division, led by Arthur Curry. One of Curry's men, is George Lewis Eastman. George, who left his wife Henrietta and young daughter Ethel behind in Toronto, has been fighting for over a year. He's already won the Distinguished Conduct Medal, one of Britain's highest awards, for catching a grenade and throwing it back at the Germans. My dearest wife, the War Office wrote and wanted to know what I wanted done with my medal. So I wrote and told them to send it to you. I will let you wear it until I get home. Well, dear, bye-bye. With lots of love from hubby and daddy, George. Julian Bing asks Arthur Curry to plan the counterattack, to retake the positions lost on June 2nd. Curry prepares carefully and methodically. Artillery is massed behind the lines. Canadian and British aircraft continuously photograph German positions trying to locate artillery and machine gun emplacements. When all the preparations are complete, Arthur Curry's troops will attack from their position on Observatory Ridge. And when they do attack, it will be under cover of total darkness. We're on the Canadian front lines on Observatory Ridge. By June 12th, Arthur Curry was satisfied that all the proper preparations had been made for the attack, that the artillery had been brought up, that the aerial spotting had fixed all the positions. He had brought in four of his most experienced battalions for the attack. And in addition, he wanted them to attack at night, which was going to give an extra punch for their attack. By 1.30 a.m. on June 13th, the Canadians were ready, and they launched their attack from these fields on both sides of where we're standing. Over here is Montserrat, 
This was the responsibility of the 3rd Battalion, the Toronto Regiment, one of the most experienced of all its fighting units, and of course one of the men in the attack was George Eastman. My dearest wife, I just read your earlier letter and I also received the box. The pudding was lovely. I'm in the YMCA and the boys are lining up to get a lot of stuff to take in the trenches with them. Poor fellows, they may get shot on the way in and never enjoy them. This is a great game of chance. Well, they're yelling for me to hurry up, so I will say bye-bye for this time. Your loving hubby and daddy, George. For days, the German lines have been blasted with a deluge of shells. Then, after a final short burst of artillery, at 1.30 a.m. on June 13th, the Canadian infantry attack. The Canadians surge forward, and in less than 40 minutes, the attack sweeps the Germans off Mount Sorel, recapturing Observatory Ridge and almost all the terrain lost on June 2nd. Julian Bing and Arthur Curry's plan to recapture Mount Sorel works. Arthur Curry. Thorough preparations must lead to success. Training, discipline, and determination to conquer is everything. But the success had not been cheap. There were hundreds of casualties. George Eastman's fellow soldier writes home, I have some very bad news. George Eastman was killed just when they were going to make a charge on June 13th, about 1.30 in the morning. The last remark he made was, well, I've been out here 16 months and they can't get me, when shrapnel hit him in the back of the neck and he was killed instantly. In my section, all were wounded. It's really hell up there. Tell Mrs. Eastman that all the old boys that are here and those that are wounded feel for her and her sorrow. We're in Bedford House Cemetery, one of the most beautiful cemeteries in the entire Ypres salient. This group of graves are all men of the 1st Canadian Mounted Rifles killed at Hill 62. They were found in a little grouping near the Canadian Monument in 1919 and reburied here. Here's Private E.J. Hogan. 1st Canadian Mounted Rifles, 5th of June, 1916, age 31. Across the sea, you rest, dear son. For us, the battle you have won. Of course, there were other men who were found at this time, and one of the remains was that of George Eastman from Toronto. He had been killed in the counterattack on the 13th of June, and it took until 1919 to basically put his story to rest. Corporal. L.G. Eastman, DCM, 3rd Battalion, Toronto Regiment, Canadian Infantry, 13th of June, 1916. He was 43. And he left a family at home in Toronto, solely missing their daddy. My dearest wife, I don't want you to worry, dear girl. I could not stand it if my own dear girls were not provided for, and I hope I may be spared to come home to them so they never will. I hope you and Ethel will have good health, as that is a great thing in this life. Give my love to all. Bye-bye from your loving hubby and daddy, George. This is Canada's memorial to the Battle of Montsorel. It reads, Here at Montsorel and on the line from Hooge to St. Eloy, the Canadian Corps fought in the defense of Ypres April to August 1916. The Battle of Montsorel was typical of too many battles in the First World War. Thousands of casualties with very little gain. It cost Canada 8,000 men killed, wounded and missing. The Battle of Montsorel was a turning point for the Canadian Corps. It showed with good leadership, proper preparations and planning, they could beat anybody. And the relationship between General Bing and General Curry here at Montsorel developed and ultimately led to Canada's greatest victory at Vimy Ridge. Of course, after Vimy Ridge, there were promotions. Curry takes over command of the Canadian Corps, and he meets his first big challenge at Hill 70.
In the year following the Battle of Mount Sorel, the Canadian Corps earns honours in other fields of battle. At the Somme, the Canadians push back the German army in weeks of vicious fighting. And then smash the impregnable German fortress at Vimy Ridge. These victories are brought about and inspired by the leadership of General Bing and officers like General Curry. But such victories are not without cost. By the time Vimy Ridge falls, 30,000 Canadians have paid with their lives. Now in possession of Vimy Ridge, the 100,000 strong Canadian Corps dominate the theater of war around Vimy and on the Douai Plain. We're on the Vimy Memorial overlooking the Douai Plain. And this is the scene of Canada's great victory on April 9, 1917. In many ways, the victory here was a culmination of all the improvements made or started at Montsorel. In less than a year, Julian Bing had transformed 100,000 individuals into a cohesive fighting unit. In many ways, the capture of Vimy Ridge was Bing's gift to Canada. The Canadians are now known as some of the toughest troops on the Western Front. On July 6, 1917, General Bing is promoted to head the 3rd British Army. Arthur Curry, commander of the 1st Canadian Division, takes over the Canadian Corps. Unlike Julian Bing, Arthur Curry does not look every inch a soldier. The troops call him Old Guts and Gators. After Curry's promotion, there was some concern as to whether he could fill Bing's shoes, and it would not be long before Arthur Curry would have his first test on the battlefields of Hill 70. Lying to the northeast of Vimy, Lenz is a strong point in the German defenses. The Germans seized Lenz in 1914, since it is a key French coal and steel producing city, and they spend two years fortifying the city and the heaps of waste rock from its coal mines, the famous Lenz slag heaps, or Cressier. While the Canadian Corps fights its way towards Lenz, the men are rotated out of the fighting line for brief periods of training and relaxation. For these men, the region around Vimy becomes home. We're on the grounds of Chateau Olin. Olin is a small village about 20 kilometers west of Vimy and west of Lens. And it was in small villages such as these that the Canadian Corps came in 1917. During the Great War, the Canadian soldier's life was one of contrasts. You had the sudden death and the mud and the snipers in the trenches, and you had the rest billets, which are really these uh, beautiful French villages in the countryside. For soldiers, the rest life was the best one, of course, because it was here that they would play their crown and anchor, or they'd write their letters, or go and visit the various uh, tourist attractions in the area. For the last hundred years, tourists have been visiting this tower, and of course, uh, some of the less polite ones have been carving their names onto the walls and into the bricks, particularly this limestone. And of course, some of those impolite tourists were Canadian troops, and here's an example of one right here, Private C.F. Brodick, 50th Canadians, 1917. Well, this is the top of the observation tower at Chateau Olin, and as you can see, there are literally thousands of names engraved all over the chalk bricking here. Some of them are very interesting. Most of them, in fact, relate to the Canadian Corps, or a lot of them do. 696-998 W.M. Cockburn, 50th Battalion Canadian Infantry, and of course it's got a date, 18th of July, 1917. It's at this time the Canadian Corps, 100,000 strong, are planning and getting ready for the big attack on Hill 70. In the summer of 1917, the British Army undertakes a huge offensive in Belgium. To draw the Germans away from this new offensive, the British High Command orders Arthur Curry to stage a diversionary attack on the city of Lens. 
Curry climbs a hill that overlooks Lens and examines the terrain. He studies every angle and then concludes that for his troops, Lens is a death trap. If the Canadians attack the city itself, they will be trapped on low ground in a tangle of barbed wire, tunnels, dugouts, and machine gun nests, and under German fire from the heights. We're standing on a large slag heap, or crassier, on the southern edge of Lens. And throughout the Great War, this was a powerful observation post for the German army. You can actually see to the north the double crassiers, which were also German observation posts for most of the war. You can see the city of Lens over here. The Germans were very concerned about losing Lens, so they flooded this entire area and fortified these slag heaps. And really, it became almost an impossible wall for the Canadians to breach. Sir Arthur Curry, the new Canadian commander, was asked to make a diversionary attack against these slag heaps, but Curry had a better idea. Curry's idea is in a lightning attack to seize Hill 70, a stretch of high ground north of Lens and overlooking the city. The 1st and 2nd Divisions will attack Hill 70, while the 4th Division makes a diversionary attack on Lens itself. To save the city, the Germans must counterattack, and when they do, Curry's pre-targeted artillery will slaughter them. On Hill 70 and in the streets of Lens, Arthur Curry intends to kill as many German soldiers as he can. The men's confidence was born of good training. They had trained for this particular job. They had rehearsed the attack many times, and each and every man knew just exactly where he was going in the attack and what he was going to do when he got there. Every feature of the German defense was studied, and definite plans made for overcoming every obstacle. Insofar as it is humanly possible to make such plans before an attack. After weeks of preparations, the Canadian Corps is ready for the attack on Hill 70. The night before the attack, Canon Frederick Scott, chaplain with the 1st Division, joins the troops. On the evening of August 14th, everything was ready for the attack, and I made my way to the 7th Siege Battery, for I had arranged to go to their observation post and watch the barrage from there. The barrage was to begin at 4.25 in the morning. The stars were shining beautifully, and the constellation of Orion hung on the horizon in the eastern sky with the pale moon above. A great silence, stirred only by the morning breeze, brooded over the wide expanse of darkness. Then at 4.25, the guns burst forth in all their fury. And all along the German line, I saw not only exploding shells, but the bursting oil drums with their pillars of liquid fire. At once, the Germans sent up rockets of various colors, signaling for aid from their guns, and the artillery duel of the two great armies waxed loud and furious. I stood on the hill with some of our men and watched the magnificent scene. While the bombardment thunders overhead, 30,000 men of the Canadian Corps crouch in their trenches and wait to go over the top at Hill 70. These were the front lines of the 1st Canadian Division for the Battle of Hill 70. In fact, you can see all sorts of evidence of the First World War in these fields, just here in the chalk spoil, which all comes up from old trenches. You see, of course, the Farmer's Friend, which is a piece of, I think, a German shell that dates back to 1915 or 1917. Even something like this. It's a buckle off a piece of webbing equipment. And this down here, there's there's even bullets. These fields are just full of uh, shrapnel balls, bullets, other pieces of equipment. You have to remember the fighting was severe here in 1915 and in 1917. But this was the line that the Canadians held. You can actually see over here, this little knob is the infamous Hill 70, which really isn't much of a hill at all. But it was a deadly position in 1917. So from here, 
4.25 a.m., 15th of August, the Canadian artillery just destroys these positions, both in the front line and in the back. And at 4.25, the Canadian troops leave their trench and start the walk across these fields. As the Canadian guns catapult a deluge of fire into the German lines, the field guns lay down a smoke screen. Waiting for the attack to begin is Major Joseph Chabal, the 22nd Regiment, the Van Dues. Zero hour, it's suddenly pure hell. A thousand gun barrels explode with a thousand flashes, lighting up the horizon. A second after, a thousand shells pass over our heads. In the trenches, it's almost like a release. Finally, forward! The Canadians climb out of the trench and gallop behind the artillery barrage about 300 feet away and which lifts off every two minutes. When they get over the surprise, the enemy pulls himself together and shells start to fall all around us. Soon they've got the range and explosions open up holes in our ranks. Machine gun fire rips over no man's land, ground that belongs to nobody. Only death can claim it. This is a, a German bunker or a pillbox, and it was part of the German main defenses in front of Hill 70. You can see that the Germans took these positions very seriously, and they have a number of these pillboxes built into their lines. Lens was a very, very important place because of its coal mining, and the Germans knew this. They also knew the only real approach to it was from the north. So on the morning of the 15th, the Canadians came across these fields, took the bunker, and advanced right over this rise. The sound is deafening and you have to yell if you want to make yourself heard. Every two minutes the curtain of fire and steel lifts off and lets the attacking troops climb out of shell holes and leap ahead, attacking with grenades and bayonets. German machine guns under this fierce assault stop firing. The men of the 24th and 26th leap out of the trenches into a hurricane of fire that redoubles when the Germans realize that the attack is going to continue. And shells keep falling on our trenches and it doesn't stop for two days. But still, while the others are attacking, we can rest. Within 20 minutes, the Canadians had taken the German lines. The attack was running very smoothly which is really not typical for First World War battles, but it's very typical of Curry's planning. It was very methodical. They moved across these fields, through the Bois Rose, over Hill 70, and broke into the second positions. That's, in fact, when they ran into the hardest opposition in an area known as the Quarry, which is now an industrial estate. Meanwhile, to the south, the second division was fighting its way through the rubble of the suburbs of Lens. <laughs> In Lens, the battlefield moves into the city. Fighting goes on street to street, in people's homes, backyards, and bedrooms. It is a hellish fighting ground, as Private John Harold Becker soon discovers. I saw coming in the flashing light a bomb apparently thrown by a German from the next bay of the trench. It was a potato masher. I had no chance to escape it. It lit on the bottom of the trench and exploded about four feet from me. It blew me into the corner of the bay, stunned me for a moment, and actually powder burned the back of my left hand. But I was otherwise uninjured. Harold Becker picks himself up and pushes on through the German trenches. I said to one of our men, here's a prisoner for us. The man looked at the prostrate German, uttered an oath, kicked him as he lay looking at us, and then pointed his rifle and shot the German through the heart. There wasn't even a gasp. The action shocked me, but I'd had it drummed into me repeatedly during my training, and we were told prior to this raid that only five or six prisoners were wanted, that we should annihilate the rest. We're in the streets of Lens, and during the Battle of Hill 70, the front lines actually ran through these houses. There were no trenches like at Hill 70. This was literally street fighting. Trenches went from 
basement to basement from house to house. Snipers used the second floors and all the Germans and machine guns would be hidden in the basements. During the attack on the 15th, the Canadians broke through these areas and many groups were cut off. And some of them found safety hiding in basements such as this one. You can actually see the old coal chute here. The upstairs part of the house was intact and the Germans were firing from it. So I ran into it through the broken front with Lieutenant McLean following when he was hit. I dragged him into the house and down into the cellar. I could hear the Germans getting machine guns into position upstairs. They didn't know we were in the cellar. We were trapped. Two days later, our artillery opened on the buildings. They seemed to hit everything but the place we were in. Our cellar was full of smoke and brick dust, but they never hit it. Sunday, and then Monday. The artillery kept pounding away all day and through the night. Finally, we heard our men overhead, and they found our cellar steps. A man said, come out, you bastards. I called out. I yelled at them to look at my shoulder colors, and then they saw it was all right and gave me a drink of water. I told them there was a wounded officer down below and took a bottle of water down to Lieutenant McLean. In three days of vicious fighting, the Canadians capture and hold Hill 70 and the suburbs of Lens. As Arthur Curry had calculated, the Germans are desperate to take the lost ground and counterattack. And they also make a determined stand in a warren of trenches, the chalk pit. We're standing on what were the Canadian final objectives for the 15th of August, 1917. Now, as you can see, today it's an industrial estate. You can see the factories over here, the big box stores, the hotels. This little field in front of us was known as the Chalk Pit. And, of course, it was in the Chalk Pit that the 10th Battalion fought hand-to-hand -hand with the Germans on the 15th and 16th of August, 1917. It was a tremendously vicious battle fought in this area. It was also across these fields that Harry Brown made his famous runs that won on the Victoria Cross. And just south of the Chalk Pit it was where O'Keel Learmonth led his famous defences of the Canadian trenches. You can see it's just over here. During days of ferocious German counterattacks, Captain O'Keel Learmonth commands two frontline companies that stop the Germans. Learmonth is wounded many times, but he keeps firing his rifle and throwing grenades. When he can no longer fight, he directs the attack from a stretcher. Only when the Germans have been driven back does Learmouth allow the stretcher bearers to carry him off the field. He dies later that day. We're in Nule Min Communal Cemetery, about five kilometers from the Hill 70 battlefield. In it are buried about 100 Canadians who were mortally wounded in the battle. The battle itself was won on great planning, great execution, and incredible bravery and in this cemetery are buried two Canadian Victoria Cross winners. One of them is Private Harry Brown. And he died of wounds on the 17th of August, 1917, and he was only 18. Brown won a classic Victoria Cross serving as a runner. He crossed no man's land several times in heavy fire to deliver messages, and unfortunately the last time he was mortally wounded, although he did succeed in delivering the message. There's a second Victoria Cross winner in this cemetery as well. The first days of the Battle of Hill 70 was really an attack for the Canadian Corps and it was quite successful. But the heaviest fighting actually came on the 17th, 18th and 19th when the Germans mounted dozens of counterattacks. And it really came down to the courage of the men in the trenches to fight them off. And one of those great men was Major O'Kill M. Learmoth, VC Military Cross. 2nd Battalion, Eastern Ontario, Canadian Infantry, died of wounds 19th of August, 1917, age 23. The personal inscription reads, he counted not his life dear unto himself. Learmoth was typical of why the Canadian Corps was successful. They really had total commitment to their cause and they sacrificed all for the Canadian Corps. Hill 70 is the most difficult attack the Corps has ever undertaken. The backbone of our army is the non-commissioned officers. 
The high casualties among the officers and NCOs proves they were true leaders. They had trained their men, and on the day of battle, they led them. Don't you see we simply must win with leaders like this? I thank God many times that it is my privilege to serve with them. The Canadians had captured Hill 70, and even more important, they hold it. The Germans hurl their best troops in counterattack after counterattack, trying to drive the Canadians from their gains. As Curry planned, Canadian artillery obliterates the Germans each time they rally and approach Hill 70. German dead are strewn in every cranny of the landscape. 30,000 German casualties in just a few days. But before the battle is over, the Canadians too will be forced to sacrifice more men on the battlefield of Lens and Hill 70. On the battlefield of Hill 70, 8,000 Canadians have fallen, dead, wounded, and missing. With Hill 70 firmly in Canadian hands, on the 23rd of August, the Canadians hope to seize an even bigger victory from the German army, to force the Germans to abandon much of Lens itself by seizing the slag heap that dominates it, the Green Crassier. Attacking up the steep slope of the Green Crassier is a dangerous, almost impossible task. Some officers object that the attack is suicide. Under the cover of artillery and machine gun fire, the men from the 44th Battalion advance through Lens towards the slag heap. They gain the crest and fight their way across the shell-churned plateau, occupying the position as ordered. But the Germans counterattack, cutting the men off. With the 44th Battalion is the battalion's company scout. The slag heap was sure an easy place to dig in, nothing but old coal slack and loose dirt. Then we were up so high you dare not look out or they would shoot you in the head from any direction. The Germans had a trench they could come up. So close to us they could throw their potato mashers at us. At first, whenever they came at us, we put them away with our Mills bombs. But they were soon all gone. I knew it was hopeless up on top, so I worked down to the left. About that time, the Germans closed in again, bombing heavy. We're on a slag heap that was known as the Green Crassier, and it was on the Green Crassier that one of the most valiant actions in the entire Battle of Hill 70 took place. On the morning of August 23rd, 1917, about 200 men of the 44th Battalion from Manitoba stormed up this Crassier, which is about 80 meters high, and captured all the German positions that were entrenched here. It was a tremendous feat of arms. Unfortunately for the men from Manitoba, all the attacks around them failed and the Germans had cut off no man's land and in a series of small battles over the next 24 hours every man up here was either killed or taken prisoners. We all laid very low. We figured we might manage to work our way back to our lines again. Then the Germans were moving around and got sight of us. They did some shooting and bombing and during the little skirmish about half our men went down and the rest of us surrendered. The Germans do not abandon Lens, and the 44th Battalion loses 258 men, many killed, and many whose bodies will never be found. There is nothing on the Green Crassier to commemorate the bravery and courage of the men of the 44th, but that's typical of the Battle of Hill 70 itself. There is no memorial. Nothing marks the courage and sacrifice of the Canadian Corps, and it's truly one of Canada's lost battlefields. But not all the fallen die on the battlefield. During the battle, one man is found not to be with his men. Company Quartermaster Sergeant William Alexander had fought bravely for three years. But when asked to lead his platoon into battle, he disappears. When he is found a few days later, 
he's accused of desertion and taken to the village of Houshan, 10 kilometers behind the front, put on trial and condemned to death. Canon Frederick Scott learns of the case the night before the execution. I told the brigade chaplain that I was going to ask the army commander to have the death sentence commuted to imprisonment. The general told me that the only person who could stop the execution was a divisional commander, seven miles away. It was not long before we were in a car speeding down the roads at a tremendous rate. The divisional commander talked over the question very kindly, but told us that the courts had gone into the case so carefully that he considered it quite impossible to alter the final decision. We stopped at a brick building where the prisoner was, and I went in. He said, I know what you've been trying to do for me, sir. Is there any hope? I said, no, I'm afraid there is not. He took the matter very quietly and shook hands with me. A few moments later, the guards entered and put a gas helmet over his head so that he was completely blindfolded. Then they handcuffed him behind his back. Outside, the firing party stood at a little distance with their backs towards us. It was just daylight. A drizzling rain was falling and the country looked chilly and drear. A round piece of white paper was pinned over the prisoner's heart by the doctor as a guide for the men's aim. I went over and pronounced the benediction. He added, And may God have mercy upon my soul. The doctor and I went into the road on the other side of the hedge and blocked up our ears. But of course, we heard the shots fired. Every grave and every cemetery has its story, and the stories are always tragic and always terribly sad. But the story of William Alexander is truly a disturbing one. It states here, Company Quartermaster Sergeant William Alexander, 10th Battalion, Alberta, Canadian Infantry. And Alexander was one of 25 Canadians executed by the Canadians during the First World War. He had served since 1915. He had actually fought at Montsorel, where he had actually done very well. But during the Battle of Hill 70, he lost his nerve, and basically he ran away. The company commanders and the officers of the 10th Battalion felt that this was just unacceptable. They had suffered over 350 casualties themselves during the battle. And although it doesn't say it, he is a casualty of the Battle of Hill 70. The Canadian Corps' diversionary attack at Hill 70 has succeeded brilliantly, inflicting a devastating loss of 30,000 casualties on the German army. But the main attack by the British Army in Flanders will soon bog down in colossal failure. And so the British High Command will be forced to call on the Canadian Corps to turn this catastrophe into victory. In a little over a year, the raw amateur Canadian soldiers of Mount Sorel have become the deadliest Allied force on the Western Front. General Arthur Curry is very pleased. The year 1917 has been a glorious year for the Canadian Corps. We have taken every objective from the enemy we started for and have not had a single reverse. Vimy, Arlieu, Frenoy, Avion, and Hill 70. All signify hard-fought battles and notable victories. I know that no other Corps has had the same unbroken series of success. All this testifies to the discipline, training, leadership, and fine fighting qualities of the Canadians. These are the Canadian battle honors of the First World War. The Great War brought much suffering to Canada, but it also brought a sense of nationhood and a sense of pride in the accomplishments of the Canadian Corps. And two of those accomplishments were the Battle of Montsorel and the Battle of Hill 70. There seems to be only so much time to be devoted to the Canadians in the First World War, and, and Hill 70 and Montsorel really don't fit in. We should never forget that 5,000 Canadians died on these lost battlefields.
It was a glorious victory. And I am sure the people of Canada will be proud. Words cannot express the pride one feels in being associated with such splendid soldiers. The only regret one has, and it is a very sincere one, is that one has lost so many gallant comrades. Men whom a young country like Canada could ill afford to lose.